this is an exciting panel of speakers that we have today. Um, we are gathered here to talk about COVID and in the panel we have um, Susan McLaughlin. She is from the Marion County Health Department. We have Antonio German. He's from the Salud Clinic here in Woodburn. And we also have the Deputy Chief from the Woodburn Police, Marty Pilcher. And today we're gonna go through a um, series of questions and talk about COVID in general. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, give everyone a few words to say about themselves and what they do. Always happy to start. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I am Susan McLaughlin, as you can see and hear, and I'm a health educator with Marion County Health Department. I've been the health promotion and prevention supervisor now for a while. I've been in public health for 25 years and I'm here today to talk to you as the uh, liaison from the health department to our community. So thanks for being here. Yeah, my name is Tony German. Uh, I'm a family doctor and I'm uh, the clinical medical director here at Woodbird at uh, Salud Medical Clinic. Pleasure to be with you. My name is Marty Pilcher. I am the uh, deputy chief of the Woodburn Police Department. Um, I work directly uh, for the chief of police. I've been a police officer for 32 years and I've been with the Woodburn Police Department for about three and a half now. Thank you. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of why we're doing this. We're trying to be as culturally inclusive as possible to try to reach the diverse community in Woodburn and share information. So without further ado, I'm gonna to go to the first question that we have prepared, and it is for uh, Dr. Germán. What is the coronavirus, and is it the same as COVID-19? Terrific question. I think starting off by identifying what we've been talking about in the last four months and what we've all been living in is knowing what the terms are. Um, Coronavirus is a type of virus that it causes the common cold, and uh, COVID-19 is a term that was developed by the World Health Organization and further uh, being more specific to this type of virus, as this is a new virus in our communities and throughout the world. So what it really stands for is coronavirus in the year 2019. Uh, disease. And so those two terms are essentially equivalent. Uh, however, the COVID-19 term simply is more specific. Why is COVID-19 so dangerous that we must all take unprecedented measures to contain its transmission? Many people have probably heard the term novel virus or new virus in the community. And um, the difference between uh, coronavirus, which is a normal RNA virus that is causes the common cold, it's among many different viruses that can cause runny noses, congestion, cough, sore throat, body aches. Uh, this virus is new and hence our bodies have never seen it before. So our ability to mount a response to fight it off is very different because we don't have um, those uh, forces in our body to, to fight it. And um, uh, just as we can see uh, some of those symptoms, there is a lot of overlap um, with those. And that can be something as similar as the influenza virus um, and many uh, other viruses in the community. Um, so it, it can be a hard distinction with this virus. And that's some of the trouble that we've seen in the medical community to really uh, identify uh, somebody might have allergy symptoms with just a runny nose or congestion. That could be this coronavirus. Um, or we have a number of people that have asymptomatic presentations, meaning they have no symptoms at all. And that's been the real challenge for us as a nation and in the world to uh, identify who is uh, with the virus and who is without. Who is at higher risk of contacting COVID-19? So um, when we look at the data and we look at research, we're discovering more and more each day goes by in, in this virus. And a lot of uh, very intelligent people are doing really fantastic work on this. Uh, we're finding that the virus has a means by which it enters the body through different receptors. And when we look at different age cohorts or different age groups, there are people that could be uh, more highly affected. 
So the good news is we are seeing the, those of younger age, uh, kids in particular, those under the age of five or uh, school age, um, are, are much less likely, it, it appears to be, to contract the virus. Um, now, when we look at who's at biggest risk of, of um, having complications or um, unfortunately facing, you know, death uh, from this virus, uh, it is those that are usually uh, an older age group. Um, so um, as compared to a group that is age 50 compared to age 60, those in the age 60 group are going to have and, and suffer uh, uh, more consequences of having that virus. And the same could be said for somebody that's 80 compared to 70. Um, so the older age ranges, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, have a, a tougher time with this virus. The other uh, point I want to make is that there are people with pre-existing conditions, people that have medical complications that put them at a uh, heightened risk as well. Those could be individuals that don't have an immune system and completely function, what we call immunocompromised. There are many different conditions that could fall into that category. There might be people that have respiratory problems such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, uh, a history of smoking, um, uh, people with cardiac disease, uh, people with heart trouble, um, uh, and, and people um, with other uh, chronic illnesses that are affecting other organs in our body, such as their kidneys or their liver, um, that they don't have the same uh, reserve as far as if they were to be affected by this virus. If someone in your family gets infected with this coronavirus, how do we protect the other members of our family? Very important question, you know, because uh, we really want to protect our own family members and those that are closest to us. Um, with this, uh, what we've been trying to advocate is if you live in a household, perhaps that has uh, uh, several rooms, you know, to uh, have an individual isolate in one room. Uh, if you happen to have another bathroom that you're making sure that you are uh, utilizing only that restroom as opposed to have a communal uh, share of a joint room or another bathroom. Um, I, I would also uh, extend this question to uh, Susan, perhaps, because there are some resources in the community that we're trying to augment uh, to give people resources should they in the event that they don't um, have access to that space. Um, there are some things in the county from a public health standpoint that we're trying to attempt to do. Obviously, there are restrictions on that and capacity, um, but we wanted to make every effort to limit our exposure to other um, uh, family members. So again, uh, trying not to cook in the same place, trying not to use the same restroom in the same facility and same surrounding, uh, maintaining our distance of six feet from uh, everybody else. Uh, one means of uh, uh, decrease in the transmission is wearing a mask, particularly if, if you have been found to be positive for this, because your risk of uh, spreading uh, the virus particles through droplets reduces remarkably. What measures can we take um, to stay safe in the workplace? I think it's important to piggyback off what Dr. Jaman was saying that um, this is a respiratory illness that passes from person to person in respiratory droplets. And that can happen as they come out of you through your breath, through a cough, through a sneeze. It can also happen when those droplets land on something and then we touch them and transmit them from our hands back up into our own respiratory system. So whether we are at home or we're out shopping or we are at work, the basic prevention messages are about keeping ourselves distant from those droplets and safe from those droplets. So washing hands is really our first line of defense. So whether you are at work, coming to work, going to work, coming from lunch, um, it's really important to wash those hands several times a day, especially if you go from room to room or something like that. Um, cover your coughs and sneezes. So if you're at work and you have allergies or you're not feeling so well, make sure you're using that elbow or using a tissue and then disposing of that tissue right away into a waste basket so it can be properly thrown away. 
We also want to remember, at, even at work, not to touch our own face. And that's been a real hard habit to break for a lot of folks. It's really tough even sitting here on camera not to swipe my hair or itch my nose. So uh, keep those hands away from our face unless we know they've been thoroughly and freshly washed. And at work, of course, we're going to practice that social distancing as well. The six feet is is the space we think we need to keep those droplets from one person from getting from one to the next. That's that's a safer distance. Okay. And doctor mentioned wearing a mask. That's a great layer of protection. It mostly protects people around me from me coughing, sneezing. Um, talking and some droplets coming out, that'll be caught by my mask instead of expelled out into the air. So while those things are sometimes not considered perfect, they're great layers of protection from us. And then of course you want to follow all the measures at work that your boss or if you're an employer that you're putting into place in your policy. Keeping your, helping your employees to be socially distant, um, work sites are staggering times for people to be in and out of the office so there aren't too many people packed into one space so we can have that distance from each other. Uh, washing your hands, adjusting our schedule, and of course the most important one in the workplace is if you're not feeling well, please don't come to work. Call your boss, work it out. In most cases they're going to be more than happy for you to not come in when you're not feeling well so that we prevent an outbreak in that workplace that could potentially make everybody sick. So again, to just kind of recap, you know, your basic prevention is washing your hands, staying six feet away from each other. If you can't stay six feet away, staggering work schedules, staggering how many people are in a room together, or wearing a, a cloth face covering, that really will help. If people aren't social distancing, will they be arrested by the police? No, and I repeat, no. So I want to make that uh, that clear. Uh, the police department is not going to arrest or cite people for failing to uh, socially distance. Is there a way to know how many people are sick um, with COVID? Well, realistically, the answer is no. There's kind of two ways to look at this question. As I look out, can I use my eyes to tell who's sick and who's not? Um, and unfortunately, we can't do that. There are many people who may have the virus and be able to infect others, but they don't have any symptoms. That doesn't mean they can't give it to you. So we can't tell by looking that way. We also can't tell by assuming someone who looks sick actually has COVID. As we've mentioned before, these symptoms happen with lots of different respiratory illnesses. So they may not have COVID. They may just have an allergy or something like that. So looking around, we can't really tell. We do have some tools that can help us estimate how many people have it. And we also can count how many people who have been tested in our communities who have test, had a positive test come back. So our data says in our county that we continue to have new cases, new folks who are going and getting a test and it's coming back positive and it's continuing to spread throughout our communities. So we can't really rely on what we see and there's not a definite way to know exactly how many people have it because we haven't been able to test everyone in our population. We've been testing people who have some symptoms or who may have been exposed to see if they're sick. So for now, we just wanna treat everyone as if they might be contagious, stay far away, wash our hands, wear our masks, socially distance, all those prevention things so that we can slow or at some point stop the spread. Can people that were sick in the past still test positive, and does that mean that they have antibodies? Excellent question again. Um, when we look at uh, how we can tell if an individual ha has uh, contracted the virus or has symptoms of that, um, there's two essential tests that we can do. One, we can look to see if the virus is inside the body, and we can directly test to see if it's, it's present. Um, that's a type of technology that we're looking for um, uh, the particles of the virus itself. The other way is to look to see if we have what are called antibodies, which are our body's uh, immune uh, uh, response uh, to fight off when we see something foreign in our bodies. Um, and so that's an on antibody test that we test through the blood. 
So the first test we usually do through the nose or through the mouth and testing and looking for the virus particle themselves. And the second type of test is the antibody test where we mounted a response, uh, think of it like our own police department and our, our uh, bodies to fight off when something comes in that it shouldn't be there. The first test can be confusing sometimes because that can remain positive even though we've now recovered essentially um, and are feeling better and we're no longer contagious. Um, uh, so that is a, a tricky question sometimes when we're answering that for um, patients in my clinic is that um, we often don't retest um, with that first test. Um, but later on down the line, we might consider a follow-up test um, or if somebody that was asymptomatic that had no symptoms during this, but they had concerns that maybe they had exposure, but they're several weeks out from that, we might offer them a different type of a blood test. Where can people find services for mental health support? I just want to um, appreciate that this is a very stressful time and folks are often having a hard time coping whether it's coping with your kids being home all the time or you're coping with being home by yourself or you don't feel good or we're feeling nervous or scared or we're having a challenge to our financial situation, any of those things. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and actually in Marion County, we're a pretty good place to find support and we have lots of places to look for support. So I want to include primary care providers. If you have a physician or a doctor that you go to and you trust, that's often a great place to start asking, you know, confiding, saying I don't feel so great or I'm getting overwhelmed. Uh, we have lots of local counselors that are in the area that we can refer you to. And I also want to include people like family and friends, you know, start sharing that you're feeling stressed and anxious can often be that uh, beginning point. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable sharing with any of those people or you're feeling like you need a little bit more than that, uh, Marion County does have a hotline that you can call. It's called the Warm Line. It's free and it's confidential and it can provide direct support over the phone directly to you. So someone on the other end who answers will be able to provide you with some quick one-on-one -on -one talk to and some resources. They're open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And in addition to some of those mental health supports and that direct referral perhaps onto a counselor if you need that, um, they can also sometimes help relieve some of those things that are causing the stress in the first place. We have lots of res resources to help you with financial support, utilities, rent, that kind of thing. Um, we have resources accessed through this line to food pantries, food boxes, social services, and they even have quite a few lists for entertainment for kids, how to beat that cabin fever. You know, there's lots of aspects to this that are causing folks some distress. So we do have that set up. So the warm line can be reached at 503-576-4602 or on your phone or on any device really, you can Google Marion County warm line and it'll pop right up for you. What is the difference between phase one and phase two? Well, phase one was our first um, try or permission from the governor to start opening our community back up in Marion County. And so we were able to start some businesses up with quite a few restrictions. Um, some businesses weren't allowed to be open yet. So we have met the criteria that we needed to meet uh, with our cases and our case monitoring and our hospitalization rates and things that we're really watching to make sure that we're able to respond and react with the care that everyone needs. Um, we have moved into phase two. And so as we entered phase two, um, more businesses could open. So things like swimming pools, bowling alleys, some of our recreation has opened up. Movie theaters have permission to open up if they can come up with a plan for people to social distance. Uh, so there are restrictions on all of this. People will need to be wearing masks indoors and they will be, able, be um, needing to social distance within the business, um, but pretty much all of our businesses have some permission to open. The other thing that came along with phase two was allow some of our restaurants and bars to stay open later so they can capture a little bit more business. So they're able to stay open until midnight now. Recreational sports can resume, including soccer and tennis and some of those that people aren't really face to face, getting right in there, falling on each other. 
Um, but when there's a little more distant like tennis, we can start playing some sports together, which is great. Uh, college sports have been approved to start practicing and planning. So go Ducks. Um, and then our social gatherings can be larger. In phase one, we were restricted to some pretty small crowd sizes. And now in general, we can have groups up to 50 indoors or 100 outdoors. So our places of worship and our places that we might gather to do something fun, our event venues, we can have more folks. So um, that's exciting news for people who are planning weddings and events um, over the summer, that we can be up to 100 with social distancing outdoors. Um, the one thing that's been added to that for Marion County is that starting Wednesday, June 24th, a couple days ago, we are now required to wear masks when we are in those indoor spaces. So um, business, when you go out into the community now for businesses, you'll be asked to wear masks. Is it true that wearing a face mask for a prolonged period of time can cause pleurisy? Very interesting question uh, from the community. I think this uh, uh, leads into a lot of questions that surround about masks and, and the questions um, that uh, are they gonna produce problems for people? Um, looking at the, the research surrounding, does this diminish or, or reduces somebody to do oxygen exchange and breathe appropriately? There's no evidence that points to that. And uh, a mask really just serves as a, a protective barrier from the air kind of quickly exiting uh, our, our mouths. And that's really what we're seeing with reductions in, in passage of this virus because it's the droplet. It's the small, it's the saliva and the droplets that come out of our mouths and, and, and are getting out uh, onto surfaces and spreading to other people that could be within that six feet distance. So um, the approach that we're taking with the uh, discussion with my patients at clinic and uh, among my colleagues is is kind of educating people that this really isn't going to produce secondary complications of somebody in somebody's lungs so pleurisy is just uh, an irritation between the, the lining of the the lung and the chest wall um, there's nothing to my knowledge base that anything would demonstrate that. And, and again, it's a it's a tool in our toolbox to help protect our community members and protect ourselves too, so. Where do I need to wear a mask? And in what spaces, if I'm not wearing a mask, will I be arrested? If there is a location where um, the governor's order states you must wear a mask, if you're not, the police department will not arrest you or cite you. Uh, we'll be, uh, if we were to get involved in such an incident, we would request, uh, we would try to educate the individual and then request compliance. Um, I will pass on one thing. Um, if a business is complying with the uh, governor's order, such as a grocery store, for instance, where uh, a, uh, as a result of that order, people coming in must wear a mask, if that store uh, prohibits you, an individual, from entering, and then there's some sort of a, an argument or confrontation over that, and the police department is called, we would not cite the person or arrest them for not wearing the mask. However, we would enforce the desire of the property owner to not have that person come into the business. We would um, uh, tell the individual that the property owner, the person in charge of it, does not want you to come in without a mask. If you won't wear a mask, then you can't go in. And that's the um, extent, of, would be the extent of our involvement in such a, uh, a circumstance. And I might just add that, you know, I felt that um, uh, this is, a, again, a tool uh, to exert your own personal responsibility as well as a community responsibility to help protect your community members. Uh, a lot of questions have popped up over the last month as far as how much are masks really doing? And the evidence continues to uh, mount surrounding that this virus is quite contagious. And when we are implementing this mask um, uh, through our community, um, through multiple different states and counties, that in, rather than this virus, if you have it yourself, the typical course is to spread that to two or three individuals. When we're using a mask, we're reducing that below one person. And so that's one of our strongest tools to help protect the transmission of this to other people. 
do asymptomatic people develop antibodies? Antibodies are our way again of help fighting when something foreign enters our body. So this virus is foreign, it's not innate to us, it's not our normal um, uh, proteins that a virus is that are, are, are the content that's in our body. So anytime something enters, we will mount a response to help fight that off. Interesting data points that, you know, just as the influenza virus, when we uh, have this every season, is that anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of people will be asymptomatic with influenza virus. So we are seeing that probably some parallels to that to the, this virus as well. So we're going to have quite a few asymptomatic people. The question that people follow up with this is that if I'm asymptomatic, am I going to be protected? Now, a lot of researchers are pointing that you will have uh, the ability to fight off that infection. In the first place, you never developed symptoms. So you having exposed again, one would suppose that uh, you wouldn't mount a, a response on the second go around. How long the antibodies last is continuing to be a study of research. So, but uh, from uh, multiple sources hearing that we suspect that the antibodies that we're developing will last likely a year, if not several years for, for this antibody response. What are some steps the families can take when they visit, especially older family members that want to visit with their grandchildren? Very challenging question. And uh, what I would say is this is a very personal question. I think this is dependent on your family's uh, wishes and desires and finding a balance what, what works for, for you as a family. All of the recommendations we've been given, I would just continue to maintain. I think still having safe visitation with our family members, it's not the same. It's hard not being able to hug our family members. It's hard not to be able to embrace them during these tough times. That's the thing we wanna do most. Um, but I think there are still some constructs and some different ways and settings we can and visit with our family members. Um, you know, a lot of people were in summertime and it's OK to uh, do visits where you're still maintaining six to ten feet of distance in your front lawn. Um, uh, creating not a large gathering, right, certainly, but personal family members, I think, is important to obviously be in touch. Also, let's use technology. I mean, we're doing this right now. And so really pushing, using Zoom, using different other tools in our toolbox um, to stay connected, check up on our families, members, make sure people aren't feeling isolated, checking up to make sure that they're not struggling with mental health. Uh, and that is a reality. So I think doing regular check-ins, um, washing those hands. If you are meeting up as a, a family group member, let's say if somebody's coming from a different city, making sure maybe they don't reside in your home. Let's look for maybe uh, an Airbnb or a rental property or a motel that has been cleaned on a regular basis. Um, those might be some different ways than uh, sharing the, the same, particularly if you're coming from a different region. Um, I think those might be some different options for people to explore, but continuing to do those things, wearing a mask, washing your hands, um, keeping that six feet of distance. If a family gets infected with COVID, um, there are some concerns that we've heard in the community that the children will be involuntarily removed. Is that true or is that not true? I'll speak for the police department. We work in concert with uh, the Oregon DHS Department of uh, uh, Health and Safety. Uh, Having COVID in the family is not grounds to have children removed from the home. Well, it kind of goes into my next question about if you come, if you found out that you have COVID-19, what's next? So um, we have lots of supports for families. So if a person gets tested and it comes back positive, one of the things that will happen was um, COVID is a reportable disease. There are over 100 of them out there. This is just another one. So reportable means that when that test result comes back from the lab, the health department in which that individual resides across the United States gets notified that that person has tested positive. When we receive that result at the county, we start trying to make contact with that person. And some of what we can offer for them is social support, 
help with how to um, figure out how to manage that in your home. If you have COVID and you have a large household, how are we going to plan to isolate you so the rest of the family doesn't get it? Um, but it has nothing to do with taking your kids away from you. Uh, it might have to do with helping some strategies to send those kids to an aunt and uncle for a couple of weeks or um, what can we brainstorm with you? But it's about keeping family safe and together. So we will contact you and start that process of educating you what's happening, what does it mean to be COVID positive, what are your symptoms right now, how can you monitor at home, and when do you need to touch base with a doctor to see if you need additional levels of care. Quite a few folks, if they are COVID positive, are able to stay at home. Not all of them go to the hospital. Uh, so while they're at home, our folks are going to call and ask how they're doing. Do they need any food? Do they need any medicine picked up? Do they need any other services? What can we help with? So I hope that kind of answers some of that question. Um, yeah. What's going to happen? And it's definitely not about taking kids away or separating families. But just if I could add that, you know, the last thing we want people is be fearful of seeking medical care. Um, there's no reason for uh, anybody be taking away anybody's children's. And when we're doing outreach, uh, we want to make sure people are picking up the phone should they uh, end up developing a positive case because the, the, that person on the line is trying to seek help for you. Um, just as the medical community is here to help you, I want to emphasize that the medical community as a whole um, uh, has taken very uh, um, robust steps to make sure that you're safe to access care, that you're not going to, if you enter into the healthcare system, you're not going to be at higher risk for contracting this virus. Um, and again, if you do get it, we're going to reach out to you and make sure the people around you are safe and get you the resources you need. I love that you said it's important to call back. Um, that is something we notice at the health department that sometimes populations are afraid or individuals are afraid and they get that call and they ignore it and we have a real hard time talking with them. Um, but we're just there to help. And then part two is really asking who else have you been around because we wanna catch those cases as quickly as we can if it's to stop the spread. That's one of our important tools for stopping this within our communities is early on identifying and testing people who may have been exposed and then getting them isolated and monitoring their symptoms so they don't continue to pass it. So really important to call back if you get that call from the health department. And you know, people, they're not gonna, they're gonna ask you a bunch of questions. They're not gonna ask you for your bank information. They're not gonna ask you for your social security number. Um, we don't care about that sort of thing. We care about your health and your symptoms and what you need to recover. And if I may follow up, Susan, what, how is that information protected? Well, um, we have HIPAA laws here, and that's an acronym for your health insurance is protect, or your health information is protected, basically. And at the health department, um, we may talk to you as an individual, but we are not going to share that information about any of your health information, including whether you have COVID or not, in any other way. It doesn't um, get passed along to your neighbors. It doesn't go to your cell phone and suddenly you have an app that says I'm COVID positive. Um, that information is protected and it stays in the health department. We're very, very, very picky about that and very careful. It seems like there's not enough uh, clarity about masks. Early on, we were say, uh, we were told that masks are not necessary, and now we're being told that masks are necessary. What would you recommend? Yeah, I think we've learned a lot as we've moved along in this pandemic, and, and as we get more research, we make alterations and adjustments that are going to be effective strategies to help our communities keep us safe. Uh, I think we also need to take into account that what did we have available for us at that time? And we were trying to promote the safety of the people that were going to take care of people when they got sick. So we were really focusing um, across the country to uh, uh, guard uh, um, the usage of personal protective equipment, such as masks for um, that healthcare sector. Um, but now we've reached capacity, we've done more research, we've done our homework, we know that this is an effective strategy. 
we're utilizing uh, things like cloth masks that are people doing and people are making those contributions. And I think um, the evidence is clear. We need to be wearing a mask to help get over this and get ourselves through this. So strongly can't or can't recommend this strongly enough. We need to keep up with those masks this is annoying they are. I'm wearing them eight, 10 hours a day, all day long. I'm, I feel free right now because I'm in my own space here that I don't need it. But um, most of, all day long wearing a mask. So please do it when you're out and about. Thank and I'll you. just add, if I can, that we have resources to get you masks. If you are a business owner, if you are a person going to work and you cannot find masks, please get in touch with the health department. We are actively passing out that PPE, not only to medical providers, but to employers and locations with, for example, seasonal farm workers that maybe they live in congregate housing, we have those things available for you. So please reach out. All right. Well, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to uh, speak with you. I feel like I've learned so much and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. As a safety reminder, please remember to wash your hands for 20 seconds and avoid touching your face. Please stay home if you're sick. If you have to head out, please remember to wear a face covering in public and maintain six feet of space between yourself and others. <laughs>